As we come before God in worship, let us share together in a prayer that is taken from the United Methodist Care for Creation team. We remember this Good Shepherd Sunday, and we also remember the events of, of tomorrow as we mark Earth Day and as we are encouraged to be caretakers of all of God's creation. So let us come together in a word of prayer. Good and glorious shepherd, we are your sheep. You lead us to the lush green grass. You pool the water so that it is so still and clear that the heavens themselves are reflected within it. Let us once again honor you by caring for this earth as you have cared for us. Let it be again on earth as it is in heaven and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord our whole lives long. As we hear in scripture, the creation around us was declared good, and so we gather on this day to remember our connection and responsibilities to our entire world, nature and people that you have created. Let us remember, and so say in our lives and our actions, it is good. Amen. So let us stand as we join in our opening hymn, number 552, When Morning Gilds the Skies. together the celebration liturgy found in your hymnal on page 43. <coughs> in the beginning was God, creating, giving birth to the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was without form and in darkness, but God spoke into the emptiness and light appeared. The dawn of our beginnings, God kept creating flowers, trees, seeds, and fruit, things that blossom and things that grow. God created more, life that crawled and life that swam, life that sprang on hooves and life that soared on wings. From the midst of the earth came yet another creature, created in God's image. There in the bounty of the garden, God crafted humanity, male and female. God breathed into them life-giving breath. God looked upon these creatures with love and said, it is good. Then God rested, seeing and loving what he had been done, setting free this creation with all its potential for good and evil. The diversity of life is no more, more profound than among human beings. We are many colors, shapes, and ages. Language, music, culture, and custom vary among us. We are a great tapestry woven from God's love. Artful weaver, we ask that we share your love with others, just as Jesus reached out and loved those most different from himself. Too often we fall short of this call seeing differences as cause for fear rather than for celebration. Instead of caring for the tapestry, we unravel the fabric of your design. We perpetuate divisions by race and color, culture, class, and gender. We Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, gave hope to the hopeless. 
Jesus challenges his followers to continue his ministry, asking us to feed, clothe, and give shelter, saying, as you do these things for the least of these, you do them for me. We pray. Remember the birthing of the church, when the people who had gathered for prayer and praise were filled with the Holy Spirit. We remember how the Spirit came upon them like fire, like wind, surrounding them, exciting them, opening their eyes and hearts to the power and presence of God. The Spirit-filled church could not stop, singing praises to God, reaching out to each other's need, spreading the word of God's power and God's love. We remember this beginning and pray that the church will be infused with new life through the Spirit, calling us, claiming us, summoning us to the excitement and joy of faith. As God created the heavens, the earth, and life itself, may God give birth to new life in us. Make God's love be known to us today through Jesus Christ. And as tiny pebbles thrown into a pond cause ripples to move outward in ever-widening circles, may our love move from this place outward, expanding to embrace our neighbors, our community, our human family, and our world. Our first scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 3, starting at the 11th verse. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. 
And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were righteous. And his Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, and not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, beginning at the 10th verse. 10th chapter, 10th verse. And Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father.
So starting last Sunday and into the coming Sunday, we'll be walking through the first epistle of John. So the first epistle of John and it has the second and the third epistle of John are those little letters at the very back of our Bible. They're not written by Paul, probably written by a community that's following in the tradition of John, but first epistles around maybe this early second century. And as I said last Sunday, when we were asking, what is the first epistle about? The church father, Augustine, summarizes it very succinctly, saying it's all about love. But it's love to whom? And love from whom? And what's the point of the love? We might ask ourselves. So last Sunday we heard, see what love the Father has given you. So the love has come as the embodiment of God on earth. That we, as we emphasized last Sunday, we are all called beloved children of God now. So verse 11 continues on with this theme. So what do we do with this love? If we are to be called beloved children of God, we ought to love each other. Okay, simple. Except maybe the next verses that we heard could be kind of those fine print, those, those warning labels. Um, what happens sometimes when we try to love? So sometimes when we love, we might recognize others who aren't recognized. Or sometimes when we love, we make things difficult for other people. And sometimes when we love, we go against the grain, against the norm. And often, the world doesn't react that well to that. And as First John says, pretty bluntly, do not be astonished that the world hates you. Wow. And then, pulling from some of the creation stories as we prayed in that celebration liturgy, we heard about God and the creation and God declaring it is good. And what we didn't hear is the story of after the creation of Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve's children, and that is what 1 John gives us an example from, of how the world is often directed and generated into not acting out of love, but instead acting out of jealousy or, or hatred. And from that example of Genesis, of what happens from the first murder of Abel out of jealousy by his brother Cain, he says what will happen as a result of what happens when we act out of hatred or jealousy instead of this action of love. So we're reminded then in 1 John of Jesus' ability, his gift to all of us to lay down his life. That's that action of what happens as a result of God's great love. A love that defied the threats of his day, the love that saw the unseen and the unlovable, and that love that Jesus made known by laying down his life. So before, though, 1 John gets into this very familiar phrase, to lay down one's life for another. We maybe heard it from the Gospel of John. So we heard, this is often called the third Sunday after Easter, is often called the Good Shepherd Sunday. Often we hear from the 23rd Psalm and this particular passage of Jesus' metaphor as the Good Shepherd, and that is what we hear today, the metaphor of the shepherd that lies down his life for the sheep. So within this passage, we heard that the shepherd, as Jesus, doesn't particularly demand something of us, doesn't lay down his life for some kind of reason that he wants something from the sheep, but the good shepherd does so willingly, um, out of love for the sheep whom he loves, for the people. So likely that the first epistle of John gets this phrase, he laid down his life for us, from these images of the good shepherd, but then takes it a little bit further and says, so what are we to do with this fact, with this knowledge? How do we act? And again, in verse 16, we ought to lay down our lives for another. Now, when I just hear this phrase by itself and to kind of take it literally on that first attempt to think about it, it kind of makes me feel like we are being instructed by First John to, to go around and to be looking for people in direct threats of death almost heroically walking around and seeing people in the, the line of an impending train coming, or a boulder that's rolling down, or a car, and kind of throwing them out of the way to lay down literally our lives for another. Now, thankfully, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often, and God willing, it won't happen to us, uh, that a boulder will come and, and be in our way. 
If it does, we might think through these words more, but thankfully, 1 John goes on with some more instructions in the last, in that last two verses that we heard. So verse 17 and 18 explains a little bit more of taking from that literal to maybe a metaphorical, how are we to lay down our lives for another? So he says, um, how does God's love live on, abide in anyone, if we have the resources, but we refuse to help someone in need? Little children, he says, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. I was thinking, how do we summarize that in today's words? Maybe, talk is cheap. Or as the great phrase from St. Francis, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Or they'll know we're Christians by our love. That all has that phrase but live God's love in truth and action. So again, hopefully those verses explain a little bit more about this instruction to take God's love and to lay down our lives for another, maybe in the literal form, but often in that ability to give of what we have to another, the giving of resources, the time, the talents. And I think it turns out that this is the foundation of what it means to be a member of the Moravian Church. So for the past two Sundays, we've had two wonderful weeks of Inquirer's classes where we have somewhat quickly traveled through 550 plus years of Moravian history, almost. And last Sunday, uh, worked our way through the 18th century document uh, that we now know by the name of the Moravian Covenant for Christian Living. So if you've been around here long enough or since last August 13th, you might remember August 13th, we usually gather outside on the green. We celebrate the August 13th celebration, the event in the Moravian Church in 1727 that was a spiritual awakening, a way that the church, in a disagreeing time when many members were not always getting along with each other, found a way to be reimagining their faith and really led to the, the international mission movement of the Moravian Church. But what we would often don't connect to that August 13th event is the foundational document, then called the Brotherly Agreement, now called the Moravian Covenant for Christian Living, but this foundational document written by Zinzendorf, Count Zinzendorf, earlier that spring. And it was, again, as I said, for these disagreeing members, the document that taught them how not necessarily just to sign on to a faith statement or say, I believe in Jesus or I'm gonna apply this creed, but how to apply that to their lives. So earlier that spring, this brotherly agreement shared with these prayer groups was what scholars believe really led to the ability of the Moravian Church that August 13th and onward to become unified in mission and service. So the brotherly agreement, or the Moravian Covenant for Christian Living, Count Zinzendorf was essentially asking us as Moravians to say not only that I'm a Christian, or not only to say, I can subscribe and ascribe to this creed or belief statement, but to live out our love in witnessing of how we live in our lives, in our community, in our nation, in our world, as First John would say, to live out our love in truth and action. And so developing this, it's not this statement of doctrine, but developing this guide to witness, this covenant for a Christian community, is what we, as Moravians, sign on to uh, anytime we become a member of the Moravian Church. So as I told the inquirers, we, we quite literally sign on to it, because as you join the church, as you joined recently, you might remember, there's a big book about this size, has the Moravian Covenant in the beginning, and at the end is the signature of each new member as they join the church. So literally signing on to, this is how I'm going to live out my faith in the world today, in the world and beyond these doors and how I live. So I was reading through the covenant, preparing, and I got to a paragraph that we would kind of gloss over. Um, we get through the witness of the Christian life in your individual, your family home, uh, living in our country and so forth. And it's paragraph 30, and I reprinted it within your bulletin, so you could take that part home. Uh, but it's entitled, The Manner of Life. 
So there's just two phrases that I wanted to point out here that I found particularly interesting for today. The one is that in the very first part, we hear the words that we are to cheerfully witness. It reminds me that in all these things that we do and practice and say and live out, as we are reminded of how we ought to live out our lives in love, share our resources, help someone, a lot of times maybe we think about that, okay, I've got to go to church, or I've got to donate this, and I've got to do this. And it becomes that kind of responsibility or that judgery or that thing that we just do. We're reminded to cheerfully witness, to cheerfully witness how we can share that love of Christ with others. <clears throat> So just as a quick aside, I always love this scene, and this is a movie long ago in the 90s, the movie Amistad. I don't know if anybody remembers that movie. It's about a slave ship when the enslaved people aboard gained control of the ship, um, but the U.S. Uh, Navy eventually regained control, boarded the ship, took them to a harbor, and as they landed on the harbor, I can't remember where it was, it might have been Massachusetts, they landed and they saw this group of missionaries. Um, they were there, I guess, probably because of various other enslaved peoples coming off, but witnessing and doing what missionaries do, except they were dressed all in black and they were singing these incredibly somber, sad songs. And to these enslaved Africans who had no idea what was going on, one said to another, you know, who are they? And they were explaining that they were missionaries and they were trying to encourage people to follow Jesus and learn more about Christianity. And the reaction of these enslaved people were, were just incredulous. How could they, showing no joy in what they're promoting, expect me to want to follow in what they're teaching? And this scene just always stuck in my head, this cheerfully witness um, to what we believe. But the second part is what I wanna, wanna focus on. Um, we have this line, and I highlighted it for you, this self-giving love, but here's where that word comes about. But in our yearning for the redemption of the whole creation, we will seek to meet the needs of the world in self-giving love. Self-giving love. That seems to me to be the love where we give ourselves out. And I wonder if the author is trying to remind us of 1 John and that verse 16, that we ought to live out our lives by laying out our lives for another, by sharing our love with another from the gift of Jesus' love. But what's interesting, particularly, is who is the covenant saying this is for? Who are we to give this self-giving love for? It is for the yearning of the whole creation. So it's not for brother or sister, for individual, for those in our community, but for the whole creation. So this Sunday, as I said, we're remembering. We just had a wonderful uh, workshop at celebrating care for creation. We're remembering the celebration of Earth Day tomorrow and our role as caretakers of stewards of God's earth. In the Moravian Covenant, I think this is one of the few places where we have the instructions to care for the whole creation. And so we asked ourselves, what is our relationship with the natural world, with the earth around us, the air and the water and the living things? We try hard not to pollute, not to endanger, not to destroy. But is this a one-way relationship? That we are the stewards of creation. We are the caregivers, the caretakers. And that all comes from us. I was inspired to think about it from a different way this week. That we care for creation because creation cares for us. Or to use the framework of 1 John, we love creation because creation has first loved us. So, how is nature caring for us? And I don't know, as I <clears throat> thought about this question, I just had this humorous image in my mind that I'm, what I'm not talking about. Do you remember the scene from Snow White? when all those woodland creatures are, are around Snow White. So we're not talking about nature caring for us, like those woodland creatures that are helping Snow White clean her house and make her bed. Although I'd love if a birds came in and started making my bed. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about with nature caring for us. What I'm talking about 
So I had this thought as we had two of the most beautiful days, warm days. Think about that now, warm days, as you're <laughs> sorry, sitting here in the cold. It's not that cold, right? You're okay. All right. But we, as we had beautiful warm days on Monday and Tuesday of this week, I took the afternoon off on one of those, took a walk, and took a moment just to sit, to watch the river go by, notice that this was the week where the red bud trees really started coming out, if you know. Uh, felt the warmth of that 70 degree day that we haven't had in quite some time. And it was like a trip to the spa. It was a gift. It was nature, it was creation caring for me, helping me to take a deep breath, slow down, put aside the tasks of the week ahead. And then ironically, as I went home, to start thinking about how to plan this Care for Creation Sunday, I realized first that I had to realize care, creation was caring for us. So in his book, <clears throat> Creation Spirituality, Matthew Fox addresses this love that creation first shows for us, he says. Creation, he writes, is the source of all living things and what is all around us. Creation is the original blessing, from another one of his famous books, Original Blessing. But he writes, the universe loves us every day that the sun rises, and the creator loves us through all of creation. Our ability to love others can be fueled and found if we first enter into nature, if we first stop to take a time away, and it doesn't need to be a five-mile hike. It can be as simple as a walk outside on your porch, a moment to stop and to ponder and to listen and to receive the blessing that nature first gives to us. The blessings that come, we're reminded, especially in the season of spring, but come back every season. And we don't do anything about it. It wasn't because of what we did, but the blessings that first come to us every season, especially now, like God saying, Again, you are a beloved child of God now. And so from this creation that blesses and cares for us, then we are asked, how do we care for all of those living things around us? Right? Suddenly, this mindset, I think, changes in us. It's not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's not something that is only because we need to legislate it. But it's a gift. It's a gift back, back to what first loved us. We use less plastic. We conserve energy. We turn off heat. <laughs> this isn't only for care for, we'll get to that later. Um, we work for policies that help the environment. We do all of this because we are first loved and it is our gift back. We are cheerfully witnessing and seeking to meet the needs of the world in self-giving love. Amen. Wherever you are in your faith journey and whatever your identity may be, we welcome you to worship here at Central Moravian Church. Um, as you heard a few allusions, we um, are moving 
forward and excitingly about this for with our uh, HVAC replacement system, our Kearns campaign. If you are on this side, you might see something different in the architecture of the, the church. We have some grills that are going to be replaced as it was this past Monday that the heat was turned off. <laughs> so you're not crazy if you didn't read, if you feel a little cold. Um, but we'll be transitioning now to our new green source of energy um, and our new system. So um, we're very excited and we do, again, thank you for um, bearing with us. When this happened on Monday, it was 75 degrees and we thought this will be wonderful. It's gonna, and then it became 30 degrees last night. So um, it will get warmer and you're not too cold yet, right? You're okay. Okay, so thank you again. And we're very excited for, thank you for the support of this project. Um, as I said, we just finished a wonderful Care for Creation workshop. We really thank our Care for Creation team as well as our Christian Education Committee and teachers for putting that together. We had lots of our own uh, folks showing uh, beekeeping and bird watching and lots of great crafts. So thank you again for that. Um, also in there, as far as caring for creation, we had the first of our collection days from our busy workers. So. That list is within your um, Sunday Times. You can see when you can donate your attic treasures that will be coming up for their plant and attic treasure sale over Mother's Day weekend. Again, our Sunday Times are full of many, many wonderful events com coming in May, so I'll trust that you'll take some time to look through those. Um, there is also a sign up as we are starting the process of thinking about more tours within our sanctuary for people interested in serving as tour guides. That's over on the Northeast Amen pews there. We do wish a very happy Passover to our Jewish brothers and sisters, as remembering that Passover begins this week. We also wish for prayers for both Paul Poiker and the Reverend Betsy Miller, who will be traveling to Western District Synod. Um, that's starting on Thursday through Sunday of this coming week. We ask for prayers for our Moravian brothers and sisters in the Western District as they begin Synod together. I do have a number of individuals that are uh, within our prayers for, tonight, for today. Um, we're remembering Louisa Fry. Louisa did go back to St. Luke's Hospital where I believe she still is uh, as of yesterday. She was at St. Luke's. So please keep Louisa in your prayers. We continue to pray for Jackson Newell. He has been hospitalized in Philadelphia, the son of Bob and Alex Newell. Um, Jackson did receive his first dialysis where um, heard word from his mom this morning that he's doing well, uh, but clearly has a, a long road ahead and we just continue to pray for Jackson. She appreciates all of our prayers. I also got a um, word yesterday um, and permission to share that uh, Judy Dexter Rice asked for your prayers. Judy has been struggling with cancer and has made the decision to enter into the inpatient um, unit of Lehigh Valley Hospice um, over at um, 17th and Chu. Uh, she does covet your prayers, and um, if you do choose to visit, please give her a call first before visiting. We also had um, some wonderful news of, of folks that are recovering from surgery. Um, Tim Brady was uh, with us at the 9 o'clock service, and we're so glad that he is um, recovering. Also, keep Craig Mosbach in your prayers as he's facing surgery next week. Um, a few celebrations. David, I see you here. David Lauer is back from Honduras. Um, mission trip went well, and um, we're really looking forward to hearing about that. Um, we also celebrate with Alyssa Jones, um, who I believe is almost home, or maybe almost home. Alyssa, um, the daughter of Annie and Dave Jones, was out in Park City, Utah, taking, play, taking part in the skiing uh, part of Special Olympics. So we're really excited that Alyssa will be representing the Special Olympics over in Italy next year. And um, this was her trial, so she's, she's coming home from that. So lots of good things to celebrate with our, our members. So again, as we keep all of those that we've named and those within our hearts in our prayers, we present to God our morning tithes and offerings.
from the words that we just heard sung, praise, we praise you, O God, for all creation. Give us thankful hearts that we may see all the gifts we share and every blessing. All things come of you. And so we pray. love in word and speech and song, but now let us practice that love in truth and in action, knowing that love comes from God, but comes through us and how we serve and live today. 